All right. So for the first example from chapter eight, uh, we're going to make sure that we go through our standard problem solving process from back at the beginning of the semester. So the first th thing that we do in any um, problem, no matter what chapter we're in, is we draw a picture. So here we have a truck that is moving east. It is moving east. And we're going to call this object object number one. So the mass of that truck is 3,000 kilograms. And the initial velocity of that truck is 15 meters per second to the east, which means positive 15 meters per second. And the other object is a car. So, little car moving to the west, where that mass, we're told, it's going to be object two. That mass, we're told, is 1,000 kilograms. And that initial velocity, because it's pointing the opposite direction or left, is going to be negative. 25 meters per second. Out of all of the things that show up in chapter 8, the majority of points missed in a typical um, assignment or quiz or test tend to be because we forget about the fact that velocity is a vector and it needs to have plus and minus signs consistent with the um, situation. If two objects are moving in the same direction, they can have the same sign as each other. If objects are moving in opposite directions, like this example, then they have to have opposite signs. Even if we decide that east and west are the other way around, one of these velocities has to be negative and the other has to be positive. Okay, so if we think about our standard problem solving process, we have a picture is step one, the given information writing that down is step two, and then identifying our unknown is step three. So part A, we're asked to find the final velocity if they stick together. So we don't know what the final velocity for this object is. And we don't know what the final velocity for this object is, for the car or the truck. But what we do know, because we're told that they stick together, that idea of sticking together means that they have the same final velocity. That means that V1 final is the same thing as V2 final, and we can just call that V final. That's our unknown that we're looking for. Okay, so in this first part, so this is part A, any time that we have a collision, we have to use the momentum conservation equation to solve that collision. There is no other tool to use. So it's on our slide here, and it's something that we have to be aware of that any time that there's a collision, we have to use the um, equation M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial equals M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. Okay, so by having this nice list, we can make sure that we know where stuff comes from. So we have 3,000 kilograms times positive 15 meters per second. And then we add 1,000 kilograms times negative 25 meters per second. All of that equals 3,000 of this idea V final plus 1,000 of this final velocity V final. Okay, so on the left, just so that we can really make sure we understand where these numbers come from, We'll put both terms first, so 45,000 positive, and we subtract off 25,000, 
And on the right side, 3,000 V final plus 1,000 V final means we end up with 4,000 V final. Now, if we take this whole left side and we subtract 45,000 from 25, uh, 25,000 subtracted, and we also divide both sides by 4,000, then we get that the final velocity here is positive 5 meters per second. So when this car and truck stick together, when this car and truck stick together, their final velocity is 5 meters per second in the positive direction, which means that that whole messed up chunk of um, cars and truck is going to be moving to the right still, to the east direction that we chose to be positive. So that's the answer to part A. When we are looking for that final velocity, when objects stick together, the key idea is that we can set those final velocities equal to each other if we are told that they stick together, and that won't always be the case. The other thing that we can note here is that um, we had to use the momentum conservation equation. And so part B is here so that we can make sure we understand this is not possible, is not possible to use energy conservation to deal with this. So let's go ahead and do part B on the board as well. So pause the video if you need to look at this part. Otherwise, I'm going to erase this kind of middle portion here. Okay. So, give us some space, but also keep the key results on our board. All right. So, part B is asking us to find the kinetic energy before the crash and after the crash. So the kinetic energy before is equal to the kinetic energy of the truck, so 1 half times m1 times v1 initial squared, and the kinetic energy of the car, so 1 half m2 v2 initial squared. That's all of the kinetic energy for the situation. So we have 1 half times 3,000 times positive 15 squared. We also have 1 half times 1,000 times negative 25, where that negative 25, we could either ignore the negative sign because we know that energy doesn't care about um, the direction, or we can recognize that mathematically the negative sign is within kind of parentheses, and so when we square it, it will become positive. Whatever works best for you to think about that is perfectly fine. Now I'm going to plug all of this into the calculator at once um, so that we don't have too much board space, and we know that our calculator can handle all of that. So we have 650 thousand joules. So the energy before when we do all of this all at once in our calculator is 650,000 joules. Okay, the kinetic energy after, it's the same kind of situation, but the kinetic energy after is because they stuck together is the total mass m1 plus m2 times that overall final velocity that we found to be 5 meters per second before. So we have 1 half times 3,000 plus 1,000 is 4,000. That's the total mass. And then 5 is squared. And so we end up with 50,000 joules, 50,000 joules. So this answers the question that was posed to us, but it's worth taking a minute to talk about what that means for us. If we look at this, the trackable energy, the trackable kinetic energy 
before they hit each other was a huge amount, 650,000 joules. And the trackable energy after they hit each other and stuck together is a much smaller amount, 50,000 joules. So where did that extra energy go? If we think about this situation, right, there was going to be a lot of misshapen metal that forces had to um, basically crush that metal, lots of sound, all of this kind of stuff, lots of energy that went into work terms, basically, work terms that we cannot easily track with physics 125 because it's not a constant force or over a single distance. It's lots and lots of little forces um, pushing metal certain distances, things like that. And all of that sound and, um, and uh, heated up metal, things like that, that's also energy that we lose to the system and can't track with our Physics 125 tools. And so this highlights for us right away one of these ideas that we're going to have to make sure that we think about throughout the chapter, that we cannot rely on energy conservation during a collision. For... Problems that we will see in assignments and quizzes and possibly tests. One thing that I want to be, uh, I want us to be aware of is that we may ask part B, we may ask that question as how much kinetic energy is lost during the collision. If we ask about the kinetic energy lost, we would find how much we had before, we would find how much we had after, and we would compare the two. And so in this particular situation, the amount of kinetic energy lost would be 600,000 joules. All right. So for the next example, we'll be thinking about um, objects that don't stick together. And when we have that situation, we'll realize that there is not a single final velocity that's the same for both. So I will see you in the next one.